Okay, well, I'm hoping you guys are still reading the book of uh, Judges slowly and deliberately, one verse at a time. There's, it's a very deep book, and um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to get into that today. What I do want to talk to do to you about today is, um, well, if you open your, your book, you open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, and today's um, uh, presentation for. <laughs> For lack of a better word, I'm going to call this uh, the most disappointing verse in the Bible. A a slight variance from my online series, Most Important Verse in the Bible. We did part 10 last week, if you you remember. Um, But this isn't even a sermon, per se, but a walkthrough of my own personal agony. Um, Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 30 I adopted as my my life verse, but I'm going to read uh, verses 30, 31, and 32. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 through 32. And it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you, along with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 30. For today's intent and purposes, verse 30 is the most disappointing verse in the Bible, in the Bible today because we don't read it as a command as it is intended. Rather, we seem to view it as a challenge. You know, like the wet paint, do not touch sign. You know, challenge accepted, right? Our sinful human nature is instinctively rebellious. And as a Christian, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say every one of us is guilty of transgressing this command. One way or another. Some day, maybe every day, but somehow, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Challenge accepted. (laughs) Somehow, we all find a way. In Christianity 2017, and thank you, Debbie. Christianity 2017, the church is full of bitterness. The church is full of wrath, if you noticed. Anger. Clamor. Clamor means a loud uproar as from a crowd of people. It also means a vehement expression of desire or dissatisfaction. So I say to you that Christianity 2017 is full of clamor. Turn on your television. It's a vehement, a very powerful, earnest expression of desire and or dissatisfaction. It goes on to say, you know, put away all these things. It says to put away evil speaking. I could tell you from personal experience that the church is, I hate to say it, I used to be a parking lot attendant, and they let out from church, and they're going out to their cars, and you can see it, you can hear it. Evil speaking. Oh, this guy did that, or I like that, or I hate this, or she said, he said. You know, it's always just evil speaking doesn't mean you're swearing all the time. Evil speaking is speaking evil of dignitaries. (laughs) I hate President Trump. Evil speaking. I hate Hillary Clinton. You know, that's evil speaking. Malice. We'll get to that. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.31, it says to put away all these things, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, and malice. You know, verse 30, as I said, was my my life verse. And I forget when when it was, but as a new Christian, these are the first verses that I memorized and, and I tried to emulate Ephesians 4 verses 30 through 32 somewhere along the way however I felt convicted in my spirit in my essence if you will in my chi in my mind I felt convicted I felt the sting of guilt that I grieved the Holy Spirit that I'm grieving the Holy Spirit so much so that I no longer adapted this passage as my life verse Ephesians 4.30, but substituted it with uh, Luke 21.36. And that simply says, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So now you know why I have such a penchant for prophecy. 
That's my life verse now. Luke 21, 36. But do not grieve the Holy Spirit. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, we have verses 31 and 32. It gives you an idea. You know, put on these things. Put away those things. So we have verses 31 and 32, but we also have James chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. But we also, as I said, we also have James chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, which says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. No man can tame the tongue. We, we may try. I do try. I aspire. And I do pretty good. Uh, hey, I, I, I'm going to blow my own horn. Usually I do pretty good at this. But there are days. <laughs> and there are days, I'm telling you, where... Verse 31 of uh, Ephesians 4.30 it ties in with James chapter 3 because verse 31, again, I'll remind you, it says, let all bitterness. You see, the roots underneath the surface is, is bitterness. Underneath the surface of wrath and underneath the surface of anger and clamor and evil speaking, bitterness is at the heart of it. Our heart. So let all bitterness... The roots underneath the surface is bitterness of wrath, clamor, anger, evil speaking. And you see the fruit of a caustic heart. <laughs> well, you, you'll see it when it says, you know, put away from you all malice. All these things, wrath, anger, clamor, and the list goes on. This is all fruits of the flesh, if you will. Works of the flesh. But I call it here the fruit of a caustic heart. Caustic, like, like battery acid. You know, it, it, it eats away. Not in my notes, but I'm reminded of, uh, I believe it's Jeremiah 17.10. It says, the heart, <laughs> the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? But like I said, we'll, we'll get to this word malice from uh, verse 31. Put away all these things, anger, clamor, wrath, evil speaking, along with all malice. Webster's Dictionary defines malice as a desire to inflict harm or suffering on another. Webster's Dictionary also defines malice as malevolence. I hope I pronounced that right. It's defined as deliberate lying or recklessness in the commission of a wrong. So I hate to say it, but I see these things in Christianity today. A lot of times you, your people are just Christian by name and name only. I used to tell my 5th and 6th graders when I was a Sunday school teacher many years ago that if we were to squeeze the whole Bible into just one chapter, we would get Colossians chapter 3. Um, you don't need to open there. If you want to, it's great. If not, I'm going to read to you just a couple verses from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Let's start with there. It says, If then, and if, if then you were raised with Christ, Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. And right now I can stop right here and just preach on that one verse alone. That's a mouthful. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. I underline this, because this is what I really want to talk about. Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. In our daily life, Monday through Saturday, <laughs> how many can honestly say, you know, you got your you got your mind set on things above? It's been my experience to read and, and to uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for to research. And it's 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 just the the cold hard truth of it. Nowadays, the church is biblically illiterate. 
there's a lot of uh, you know proof out there to that. There's a lot of voices saying that. It's not just me. It's it's the truth. It's the sad truth that it even says in Scripture. You know, talking about the end times is that day will not come until what? The falling away comes first. The people are just oh you know, yeah I believe the Bible yeah but do you read it? Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. When you read the Bible, you, it, it tends to steer your focus a little, don't you think? It gets you away from the, the, the trouble, I can't pay this bill, I can't meet that need. You know, this, the, the, the price of gas, you know, uh, taxes. We live in New York, oh my goodness, taxes are probably, you know, it's crazy. But the Bible says, it says, set your mind on things above. Yes, we're going to have worries, of course. But if you give your worries, if you just, you know, Pray about them a little bit. If you set your mind on things above, as we were doing before the service started. I loved it. Hearing everybody's prayer and, and you know, seeing and hearing your heart as you're talking to God. I love this church. We may be small, we may be few, but we're not perfect. I'm not saying that, but we're authentic. I can appreciate that. So Colossians 3, again, it says, verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Verses 8 through 10, can I read that for you? It says, but now you yourselves, and again, it backs up what we were reading in Ephesians chapter 4, now you yourselves are to put off all these things, anger. We looked at that in Ephesians 4. It says to put away wrath, malice. It also uses the word blasphemy. I'm not prepared to speak on blasphemy and, and to define it for you and to point it out to you, but you already know. It's everywhere. Turn on your television, walk down the street, go to work, listen to the radio. Any, it's Blasphemy is... is it, we're swimming in a cesspool of blasphemy in this day and age. Filth, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I digress. Verses 8 through 10, let me just read it. It says, But now you, Christians... Yourselves are to put off all these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Speaking to the church. Filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Since you have put, out, you, since you have put off the old man and his deeds. And have put on the new man. And I underlined this. Actually double lined it. Who is renewed in knowledge. There's another sermon right there. Who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. You know, <laughs> I'm getting better. But I remember a point, I remember a day, I remember a week or a month where I was constantly feeling, you know, convicted. I think it says somewhere in, in the book of Revelations, you know, talking about Christians who have lost, left their first love. And part of my first love was reading and studying the Bible. I love it. And that's why I like preaching so much. Not because I like public speaking. I'm not very good at it. I'm probably the worst. But I love the study, getting ready for it. Because I don't want to have to stand up here and just, you know, look stupid. I, I could do that seven days a week. But to be renewed in the knowledge. That's a command, by the way. It, it, it's it's imper it's it's not a, a suggestion. Is this the the terse in which in which it's written? Is that the right word I'm looking for? The, in context in which it's written, it's a command. Put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Right there, it kind of puts away, and you see it and hear it in the church more and more and more evolution. The church is, is bending over backwards to, to come alongside and to explain and to be a part of this whole evolution thing. I hate to say it, but that's, that's the cold, hard truth. We're living in a day and age with the Bible warned about, the falling away. And I believe in so doing, we're grieving the Holy Spirit of God by whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. Verses 12 through 14 of Colossians chapter 3. It says, therefore, 
You know the old saying, if it says therefore, find out what it's there for. It's there for a reason. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. Again, this is, this is a backing up. It's complementing Ephesians chapter 4, verses 32. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you must also do. But above all, it goes on to say, but above all these things, put on your sneakers. Just want to make sure you're paying attention. Put on love. And if you ask me, love is where the rubber hits the road. Love is the sneakers of Christianity. That's, that's, that's putting your Christianity to, in action is love. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And as I was beginning to say, this is where I, the conviction persuaded me to adopt an easier passage to claim, other than Ephesians 40, verses 30 through 32. Again, Ephesians 4.32 says, And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. This is a couple years removed. When I realized, it wasn't so much the things that I was doing that caused the, uh, the conviction. It's what I wasn't doing. Grieving the Holy Spirit by sins of omission. I just wasn't getting into it. Because as of yet, to, get, to forgive people in my past, <laughs> I have not done. Tenderhearted. It says, be tenderhearted. I wasn't tenderhearted. I still had a heart of stone, if you will. And Jesus was chipping away, you know, hammer and chisel. And mom, you remember, we drove down to Pennsylvania. I... I that's when I finally forgave people in my past. Maybe not so much for, to their face, but the entire trip from Pennsylvania to New York, I was a blubbering idiot. Just praying and just crying and just, it was crazy. That's when I realized, you know, that's, that's when I finally, I was a Christian for like four or five years, and I wasn't forgiving people. It was not yet tenderhearted. So that's why I abandoned Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 through 32. It was too hard. It was too hard. You know, come on, think about it. How easy does this sound? Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you, along with all malice. To me, my pain was my strength. I turned my pain into anger, and there I was strong. There I couldn't be hurt if I was if I was just taking that pain and just turn it around and, and, and build it into something else, I was invincible. Things didn't hurt so much when I turned my uh, heartache into anger. I wasn't being tenderhearted. You see that so much in the church still to this day. I'm guilty. I'm not proud of it. You know, I've been there, done that. But I see so much of the church today, and I hate to be, you know, browbeating us Christians, but you know what? We're not reading the Bible. We're not following the biblical precepts of which makes us a Christian. To be a Christian is to be Christ-like. Christ forgave people. Sometimes that's the hardest thing we have to do. But in so doing, Jesus said, can I remind you? Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. You know, maybe I've got too much stuff. Maybe my, you know, name it and claim it. Maybe my blab it and grab it. Maybe my just going out and getting mine is grieving the Holy Spirit. You know, even in the, in the guise of Christianity, I can go out there and I could, you know, I don't know, bake cookies, you know, or collect cans from the side of the road, do whatever I can to get more money so I can bring more stuff into the church. Is that what Jesus wants? Does Jesus want more stuff in the church? Or does Jesus want more people? You know, grieving the Holy Spirit. Maybe I've got too much stuff. Colossians 3, 2 said, Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. 
Is my quest to esteem more stuff grieving the Holy Spirit? Jesus was saying, again, this is Matthew chapter 6. He went on to say, he says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So it's not that, it's not that I'm not supposed to be, you know, doing stuff and acquiring and, and gaining and, and collecting and working towards. But it says, but lay up for your treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys. It, you know, it goes on where neither, you know, thieves break in and steal. It goes on. But... In the same sitting, as Christ addressed the multitudes, he also said, Judge not that you be not judged. That's the atheist's most favorite verse. If they only know one verse in the Bible, there it is. Judge not, lest you be judged. For with what you, excuse me, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider it a plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. This is in uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. I, what was it called? The Beatitudes, um, uh, chapters 6 through 8, I believe, 6 and 7, and the beginning of 8. That was one of his uh, most famous <laughs> You know, speeches, if you will. He was a teacher. He's the savior. He's the counselor. He's so he's everything. And when Christ spoke, sometimes a lot of us in the church will look at this section in Matthew chapter six through uh, beginning, you know, maybe the first half of eight, um, as one of his greatest sermons. Every word that came out of his mouth was great. Every act that he ever did was great. It's not just one or over the other. And that's what we're supposed to be, you know, we're supposed to be emulating him. He goes on in verses, uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 4. You know what he said. You know what he said. You know what Jesus called it. Hypocrisy. You hypocrite. You know, you got a plank in your eye and you're worried about this guy. You know, I would call it, let's be politically correct. Let's not hurt anyone's feelings, okay? Let's call it perspective. Okay, where, where do you set your perspective? Where do you set your sights? Your pleasure. What, what, what do you aspire to? What gives you pleasure? Your goals. What goals do you set? Call it perspective. Hypocrisy. That's yeah, a hard word, but it's the truth. Hypocrisy is our true perspective set to motion. So when you see people being a, 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 a hypocrite, you know automatically that their, their, their mind is not set on things above. Colossians 3, 2. But they're set on things of this earth. Maybe with the best of motives. I don't know their heart, but I just know what Jesus called them. And hypocrisy. I believe with all of my heart that hypocrisy grieves the Holy Spirit of God. It frustrates the work of God in our in our lives. Again, set your mind. I underline that. Your mind. Set your mind on things above. Think about, you know. Contemplate. Along those lines, if you'll bear with me, <laughs> I'm going to go back to basics. I'll read for you um, from Exodus chapter 20. Okay? If you want to turn there, you're more than welcome to, but I'll just read it through quickly. Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations to those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the, hey, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. Your God is in it. You shall do no work. Now pay attention. It says, you shall do no work, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and how it died. People get hung up on the Sabbath. They really do. And maybe to, with the best of intentions. And they say, oh, I keep the Sabbath. Do you really? Do you watch TV on the Sabbath? Someone's working to bring you that. Do you turn on the lights? Do you mow the lawn? It says, you know, not only you should take the day off, but everybody. It says, even your servant. And a lot of people, we call it services, you know, goods and services. If it's the Sabbath, you go to the store and buy milk, you broke the Sabbath. People get hung up on this thing, okay? I, I digress. It goes on in verse 12, it says, Honor your mother and your father, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover, you, covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. <laughs> this, this is where it gets interesting. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us, and we will hear you. But let not God speak, lest with, let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, "Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that His fear may be before you, so that you may not sin." Now I, I say all that just to bring you to this, this uh, verse nineteen. Then they said to Moses, "You speak with us, and we shall hear." But let not God speak with us lest we die. Verses 18, 19, and 20 to me, I'm looking at this as like men over God. We esteem men over God. We'd rather listen to a pastor one day a week than read our Bible. Because the Bible cuts to the quick. It says, where is it? Hebrews, Earl, where it says uh, it, it's like a double edged sword. It cuts to the, the soul and the spirit and the bone. And it cuts you quick, it makes you think. It, it gets in. It gets in your mind. It gets in your heart. It makes you. It changes you, and people don't want that. They would rather go someplace and listen to somebody who's going to, you know, inspire them and make them feel good. And oh, you can have your best life now, or you're great. You know, that you. A lot of I, I, I'm not off my notes here, but I just uh, had to. A hundred years ago, it seems like on uh, Saturday Night Live, there was some. Um, Al Franken did a did a a, a character named uh, Stuart Smalley. Remember, he had these positive affirmations with Stuart Smalley. He'd always be looking in this mirror and say, "You know what? You're good enough." How's that go? You're, you're good enough. You're smart enough, and 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 doggone it, people like you. See, it's all about us. We just look at a mirror. We don't look at our our neighbors. We don't look at the Bible. We look at ourselves. That's why we. A lot of people go to church to to look. At the man who is looking back at them and says, you are worth it. You can name it and claim it. You can have all this. You can have your best life now. You know, we go to church a lot of times to feel good. <laughs> but what did God tell Moses? It says here, um, or, uh, verse 20, and, and, and Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you. Aha. Uh -huh. And that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. Uh, there's a sermon right there in itself. But I suspect that the Holy Spirit is grieved when we prefer man's word over God's word. Again, Ephesians 4.30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. It's a command. You know, wet paint, do not touch. It's just human nature. It, we're, we're, uh. In Ephesians 4, okay? Well, let's get back to Ephesians 4. Um. In it, Paul writes and he says, 
This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk, and I underline this, it says, as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves, given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and I underline this, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That was Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Colossians 3, verse 10, if I can remind you, we just looked at it a couple minutes ago. It says, and have put on the new man who is what? Renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. It's all about God. Set your mind on things above. Look to the maker of the stars to give you purpose rather than look to the stars themselves. How many Christians are, are reading their horoscopes every day? I know a few. How many Christians will, will more identify with what you know their birth sign? Oh, I'm a Leo, you know. I, I'm a Virgo. I'm this. I'm that. You know. Or you know, I see it all the time. I hear it. Christians bragging on their what's that called zodiac sign? Does that glorify God in any way, shape, or form? We live in a, such a day and age to falling away, and, and we're so. We don't even realize it. We don't even realize it. And put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. This is another passage that I uh, had a very profound impact on my life. It, it, Romans chapter 12, verses 2 through 3. And do not be conformed to this world and I underline this, it says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I, for I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think, and I underline this, think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now, I can get off on a really fabulous rabbit trail right here. I, I can. This is a mouthful. This is powerful. This is life-changing stuff. But sometimes, most of the times, we read it quickly and say, oh, that was nice. But it takes no root. We don't act upon it. I know when I did, people looked at me like, <laughs> you got, you got five eyes on your forehead. What are you, you're a freak. To be transformed by the renewing of your mind, your friends are going to look at you weird you're going to give up a few things you're going to change a few things to be transformed by the renewing of your mind you got to read the bible let it take root let it give you direction and purpose and let it change you from the inside out from the inside out you know so i said it that way and not from the outside in you're, you you did catch that right okay because i know a lot of people go to you know these programs in their church so they can change the outside Jesus spoke on that. Remember what he called them? Whitewashed tombs? <laughs> Hypocrites? You know? You're going to wash the outside of a tomb, but it's, there's death on the inside? What's the point? But I went to churches that were really big on that, and God bless them. But I, I think, by way of these verses that we're looking at, that it is a strong possibility we grieve the Holy Spirit. We frustrate the will of God for our lives we forfeit maybe most of the blessings, the things that God had planned for us, when we stagnate and pollute the spirit of our minds. Garbage in, garbage out, right? Ephesians 4.23, it, it calls it the spirit of our minds. Again, here's another fabulous sermon right there just on that term, the spirit of your minds. You know, 
lot of times we become a Christian and it's just same old, same old. <laughs> Nothing's changed. I believe that we grieve the Holy Spirit when we do not actively pursue the Word of God. He wants to, com- he wants to communicate. He wants a relationship. He doesn't want a religion. So I think, I'm convinced that we grieve the Holy Spirit of God when we don't actively pursue the Word of God. When we don't read the Bible on the weekdays. And, you know, I can go on. But we're talking about the most disappointing verse in the Bible, right? Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. It reminds me, and it brings me to this point of of understand. You know, I, I don't know why I put it in this context but do not grieve we got to understand we got to understand how do we grieve why (laughs) second timothy open your bibles to second timothy we're going to spend some time in there i'll I'll try to go quickly i just want to look at a couple passages in second timothy chapter 4 verses 3 through 5 for one but open your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy, and I'm just going to read chapter 4 quickly. It says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, but we, but us, Christians, but you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Granted, Paul is writing to Timothy. He's very specific. But I think verse, chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, we can learn a lot from. I underline these. Uh, the time will come when they will, in, will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. What does the Bible say again? It says the falling away is going to come first. People, am I the only one that sees it happening? Second Timothy, are you there? Read, you, know, you don't have to read out loud, but follow along if you want to read out loud. You're more than welcome. But I want to read verses, uh, chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this is very uh, familiar to us, but chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and then separately, verses 8 and 9. You should all know this. I'm sure you do. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. In the Bible, this is not a suggestion. It's a command. It's an imperative. It says, and turn away, excuse me, and from such people turn away. For this, for of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible men and women. Can I say that? Gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I just want to stop there for a moment and separate it. What we just have is is an imperative, it's a command. There's a long laundry list, you know, of, of what it's going to be like. And it already is. I, I'm watching prophecy, and the last couple of months have just been, uh, can I say this in church? Hell on wheels. Can I say that? The last couple of months, you're watching, it's just hell on wheels. There's so much evil in this present age. Okay, so here we have a list. Know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. None of this is news to you. You've all read this before. You've all seen it on your daily news. But what I do want to look at is verses 8 and 9. Now, as Janus and Jamboree's resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds 
disapproved according to the faith. But they will progress no farther, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was, referring to Janus and Jambres. I'm not going to get on a rabbit trail. I'll just let the word speak to you. Believe me, there's a lot there. And I'm, I'm, I'm trusted that a lot of people right now in their minds are thinking a lot of different things that formulated from this passage. But can I just... Okay, First Kings chapter 3, verses 9 through 10. It's the story... Verse, chapter 3 is the, verse, uh, the story of, uh, what's his name, Solomon. God was very pleased with Solomon. And he comes to him and says, okay... You name it, <laughs> what do you want? Let me help you, <laughs> as what God said. So Solomon answered, and he says, Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart. <laughs> Stop right there. Therefore, give to your servant, give me an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? This speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked these things. You see that? He, he's, he's given a free ticket. Here's a meal ticket. Write your own ticket. What do you want? Understanding heart that I may discern between good and evil. And it pleased the Lord. It pleased the Lord. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenus and Philetus, I pronounced their names wrong, Hymenus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth, that's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 through 18a, the first part of verse 18. But it says, <laughs> Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption, right? But shun profane and idle babblings. Present yourself approved to God. Discern. <laughs> but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge, it says in the scripture. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. I believe that if we become saved only to just rest on our laurels, banking upon the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ, not only do we grieve and frustrate the Holy Spirit, the very assurance of our salvation, I believe that we run the risk of forfeit. That we would tend to gravitate towards false teachers, false doctrine, and be turned aside to fables. Colossians 3.14, we read it earlier, it says, But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Though I speak with tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gifts of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. <laughs> Let me reinterpret this for just a minute to say, nothing grieves the Holy Spirit more than an empty religion. Nothing grieves the Holy Spirit more than an empty religion. That, I believe, is the essence of what Paul is writing here in the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked. Love thinks no evil, 
does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. It goes on. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I just read verses 1 through 8. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, we could take that verse and we could do a lot of religious things as we were looking at, you know, um, I can give my body to be burned. I can, you know, sell all my belongings and feed the poor. I can have a religion. I could do all these things here. I can speak with tongues. I've been to churches where people would give you the gifts of tongue. You walk up front, they'll put their thumb on your tongue and they'll... Hey, you have the, the gift of tongues. Have a nice day. Is that how it is that how it works, really? I know. <laughs> Deer caught in the headlight looks. That's what I felt like. I'm watching this stuff, and I'm like, whoa. People are playing church. People love religion rather than relationship. People prefer religion over relationship. We saw that back in Exodus. They just got the Ten Commandments, and so Moses, you talk to us, okay? Not God. I want to hear it from men rather than from God. I, I want to hear it from a pulpit rather than read it in a Bible. I suspect that religion, nothing grieves the Holy Spirit more than just an empty religion. Love. That's what it all comes down to. Like we said earlier, I mean, there's a song, uh, who, uh, who did it? Um, Little River Band, Love is the Answer. Yeah, I'm going back a couple of years. That was a, that was a good song back in the '70s by a secular group of all things. But they had the, I mean, they had, they had a clue. It goes on. It says all these things are going on in the world, but love is the answer. If if unsaved people know this, how come we don't get it in the church? Where's the love? <laughs> First John, chapter one, verses five through nine it says, "This is a message which we have heard from him and delivered to you." That God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me just read this quickly. First John still. I just want to read chapter 2, verses 3 through 17. First John chapter 2, verses 3 through 17 says, Now by this we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk, to live, just as he walked or lived. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going, ouch, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now this section is called the spiritual state, their spiritual state. Verse 12 says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. 
I have written to you, fathers, because you known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, right? Love. <laughs> Love is the answer. And again, he's, he's saying, I have written, I have written, I write. I, the Bible. John didn't write the whole Bible, but he's, he's writing from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's God breathed, if you will. The Spirit of God told him what to write, and he did. The, God, the Spirit of God told him what to say, and he did. Verse 15 said, Do not love the world or the things in the world. So I ask, could it be that we grieve the Holy Spirit as we find it necessary to watch every minute of this is us, yet we find ourselves so easily distracted those whole 40 minutes a week that we give to the Lord? You know, you go to the church and you're thinking, hmm, who's going to win the race? You know, be honest, okay? Be honest. How many of us, how many of you are hoping your favorite driver will win the race right today right now you know who here have caught your mind wandering to something else when i was just reading from the bible anything else oh i gotta move the lawn did i turn the stove off so many so many distractions if we are honest with ourselves we could all plead guilty that somehow some way we grieve the holy spirit the falling away is in progress as we speak. It's happening right now, but we do not have to be a part of it. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, 1 John chapter 3 writes, verses 2-3 through 3 goes on. It says, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. God said what? Be ye holy, be you, be us, be we. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself, sets himself apart, doesn't have to be a part of the world, be a part of every new, you know. Did, did anyone get one? <laughs> Fidget spinner. How many How many of ran out and got, you know, 15 different colors of a fidget spinner just because it's the new thing. I think, if I'm not mistaken, probably back in the late 60s, early 70s, I had to have, and I got a pet rock. Anybody else here have a pet rock? Why? A pet rock, for the love of God. The world will sell you stupid stuff and you have to have it. Be ye holy. Don't fall for the stupid stuff, you know? And I put this in parentheses. I really don't need to talk about this, but I want to because, let me just say it. If you have the book, Revising Reality, but have not read it yet, maybe think about looking it over, okay? Just, there you go. It may help bring this passage to life, this uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. It may bring that passage to life in a way that you haven't even considered yet because we live in such a time. Things, scientists have to rethink, they have to reevaluate everything they thought they knew about the scripts or about the universe. Right now, it was just in the, the news this week. They found another object in space, another planetary body, if you will, that is going, you know, say if every, all the planets are going around the sun in a, in a clockwise position, this thing is going counterclockwise. That's not supposed to happen. It goes against everything that they think they know. That's just one example. There's, there's hundreds. I love science. I'm watching all these scientists. You do too. I see you post a few things every once in a while. You know, about all these astronomical, all these... Uh, the Bible says there's going to be signs in the heavens, right? There's signs in the heavens, people. 
and so on and so forth. But we're closing, okay? There's, there's actually quite a few more verses I, I was prepared to bring to this table today. But for the sake of time, I will trust you to consider this verse yourselves in a real and personal way, okay? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Ephesians 4, verse 30. Probably the most disappointing verse in the Bible today. In real and in practical ways, I pray that we each emulate verses 31 and 32. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another. Oh, may the grudges in the church these days. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, excuse me, even as God in Christ forgave you. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, I, I apologize that I, I strayed off script from time to time, but Lord, I'm going to trust that your word cuts us to the quick that you have revealed to us things about ourselves that we haven't even thought about or even knew or even considered, Lord, that things that we need to change. Lord, I pray that you make those changes in us. I pray that you uh, shepherd us along the path. I pray that you shepherd us because we're all like sheep. (laughs) We're all like sheep, I believe it says in the scripture, who have gone astray. And I'm praying now, that, Lord, that those who call themselves by your name, those who identify themselves as Christian, would read their Bibles, would pray, would, would want to be more like you, every day changing, every day reading and allowing your word to change us. Not that we can do it. <laughs> no, not at all. But, Lord, I pray for uh, a renewal 